Hello, and thank you for downloading and listening to episode eight of the Radio Juxtapose podcast. I don't know why I keep almost wanting to say Radiohead. I don't know why that keeps happening. This is episode number eight. We've made it. We've come this far. I'm Evan Preco, editor-in-chief of Juxtapose magazine, and with my co-host Doug Gillen, who does everything Fifth Wall TV, we spend this episode talking to the immensely influential and legendary LA graffiti artist, Revoke. Coinciding with his feature in the winter 2019 issue of Juxtapose, we decided we'd sit down with Revoke and get a little bit more insight into his career, his process, and sort of influential moments as one of the most premier graffiti writers the world has ever seen. If you want to go straight to that conversation, please do. It's about 20 minutes ahead in this conversation right now. But if you want to hear Doug and I's banter, I suggest just keep listening. Thanks again, and enjoy your listen. Hey, how are you? Hi. I'm wearing a sweater. I'm feeling good. <laughs> That's a special, special introduction there. So where are you? What have are you, you doing? Have you never seen me wearing a wait? Have you never seen me wearing a sweater before? I wear sweaters occasionally. I've never seen you wear this sweater. <laughs> and what you're probably thinking is, is he keeping track of the sweaters I'm wearing? Yes, is the answer, Evan. Yes, yes I am keeping track of the sweaters that you wear. Oh, man. Keep, keep track of how many cups of coffee I have in the middle of this podcast. It's going to be the main thing. So, uh, for context, where are you? I am home in the San Francisco Bay Area at the moment of getting ready to go to New York. Nice. What's in New York? Where are you? You're not home. Wait, you're no, not, I'm not home. home. I'm in a place called Somerset. That sounds so fancy. Uh, it's my mom's birthday. So we've taken her to a place called Somerset. And in Somerset, we're going to have a walk and some, some nice food. And we're going to do all the things that you do in Somerset. <laughs> a walk. I love how, because a walk does sound nice, but in Somerset, it really does sound like the only thing you can do is walk. This podcast has been brought to you by the Somerset Tourism Board. Somerset. <laughs> Wait, but what, what's with the Paul McCarthy sculptures? That, was that on the way to Somerset or are, they, are those in Somerset? Yeah, so I went to the Hauser and Worth uh, here in Somerset and they had some, it was just such a nice gallery. Like, because there's not much in this town that we're in. Just, they had done this space up so nice. It was like an old farm and they had completely refurbed the whole thing and it was just real good use of the space. Is that a new space or is that an older space? I can't remember. It seems, it feels fresh. Um, everything in there feels new. I'm not too sure when it came to be, but it definitely feels new. You know, so that was, that was my day today. And what are you doing in New York? New York is, it's going to be another fair week because that's just, it's on the, we're on tour and uh, Armory Fair, Spring Break, Art on Paper, Volta just got canceled. So there's that. And uh, we have an opening at Juxpose Projects on March 1st uh, with Spoke Art. So I'm going for that. Uh, so we have a lot going on. We have a lot going on in general, but this is the first wave of like big 2019 things. And then how long does that take you into? That takes me into mid-March, and then uh, I get geared up to um, perhaps go to Hong Kong for our Basel. Are you going to Hong Kong for our Basel? Uh, up and down. Up and down. One minute I think I am, the next I'm not. So it will be one of those things where I'll get a, an email like the day before being like, hey, so you coming over? I'll be like, oh, okay. Right. Yeah, I have a, I have a feeling I'm not going to go, and then I'm going to regret it like I do every year that I don't go. Yeah, it's good fun. I really I like yeah. the I like the environment out there. I like the energy. I like the people. I like everything about that that period, that week, that ten days in in Hong Kong. It's it's good fun. And then uh, you you're off to Crystal Ship and New Art Aberdeen. Yeah, that's the next one. Uh, that's the next. Yeah, that's the next couple of weeks. I got a thing in Norway uh, in March as well. Me, Martin Watson, and the open road, baby. So look out for I that. I swear, you spend more time in Norway than like like most Norwegians. Yeah, I think if anyone's listening to this and lives in a hot country and is looking for a videographer slash podcaster, please feel free to get in touch because I seem to end up in the Arctic Circle more than I would care to be in the Arctic Circle. 
It's okay. You're preparing to find property when the apocalypse happens and you need to live up there. So don't worry about it. It's good. You're, you're actually thinking ahead. Smart. Thanks, man. So we talked to Revoke the other day. We did. And he, I didn't ask the question. I didn't ask him if it was revoke or revoke. And it's he, definitely he, revoke. He, he said revoke, and because I, I watched all, <laughs> I watched like all the videos from the history of revoke, and I was like, okay, everyone's called him revoke, but there's no e in it. We were like kind of balls deep into the interview, and then he said his name, and then I was like, ah, I can't really bring this up now. And then I just I I backed off it altogether. So it is revoke, and there's no question asked. Okay, here's two things. One, that's the first time we've used the phrase balls deep in our podcast, which I love. And then second, uh, graffiti writers ch you know, take liberty with their names and pronunciation. So uh, I think that he can kind of pronounce it however the hell he wants to, right? Okay. So, loyal listener, if you're listening to this and you've been saying Revoc for a few years, don't worry. Don't worry. It's okay. You're, you're in a safe place if you've been calling him revoke give yourself a little pat in the back right now you deserve it i like the discussion because we got some insider information about some certain things that he's done but also uh we still, we talked a little bit after this but i really like his kind of explanation of coming late to the art history game and coming late to learning about contemporary art and how he it didn't it doesn't hinder him to like go out and explore new artists. Like he doesn't feel uh, like I'm 42, I can't learn anything else. Like I liked his, uh, I'm still learning. I'm like kind of in my own personal school. I like that. Yeah, he's not doing it with like a, a sort of, you know, hoodie on hiding in the corner. Like, oh, oh, you mean, you mean Frank Seller? Oh, I, I knew Frank Seller the whole time. Like, uh, yeah, man, uh, that's, that's, that's what God means. This is kind of like, it's, it's coming in with fresh eyes and he, he's kind of very open with that. And I think that's what the art world needs more of, you know, this, like, it's okay to kind of not know things and it's okay to just have that, that thirst where you want to learn more things. Like, how many times do you ever get in a conversation where someone's like, hey, do you know uh, Mark Bradford? And you're like, yeah, yeah, I know Mark Bradford. I saw that show. Uh, and you're like, who the fuck is that dude? Like, it happens so much. Like, it definitely happens to me in street art because, like, I, I sometimes there's some new European cats coming up. And I'm like, I don't know who that person is. And I'm like, oh, this person painted this wall and so-and-so. I'm like, the one I get all the time is, oh, my God, yeah, I really love his work. And they're like, yeah, sh she's great. Uh, you're like, damn it. Okay, you got me there. But it, it is something where it's like I think everybody in the art world has a tendency to like over inflate how much they know and are not and like are, aren't necessarily ashamed to be like, hey, I actually don't know about uh, Italian futurism. Like I just don't know. Like I haven't read the book. It's a funny little trend. I think Instagram really f flames this shit up where it's uh, because you see one photo, everybody seems to know what's going down. I think it, it's just, it feels like that reflects almost our age as well. In an age where you have more access to information and all this stuff. And, you know, you can be in the middle of a Twitter battle with someone and like all you're doing in that off time is like Googling to find out the history of, of whatever that journalist or that person has ever done. And you're like, oh my God, you didn't know about the 1994 retrospective. And it's like, in an age of that information, it's okay to be able to be like, yeah, actually, I really don't know everything, but I'm I'm thirsty to learn more. Don't get me wrong. I've used Wikipedia for things before, but I use it and then try to do the research through Wikipedia to something else that might be a little bit more solid. Um, but it's so it's so tempting just to, to get the surface level of everything and then say you're an expert. And it's so easy to say you're an expert now because you can easily identify yourself as whatever you want these days. So I found myself because I went to we had uh, um, we had a Jeff Koons show in Oxford, and I, I you know I, I obviously know Koons I know his work but I I didn't you know I don't really know Koons and you know whenever I do like a little video on something it's like okay cool this is like you know me just kind of like learning and then trying to bring it forward and do something on this so it's a chance for me to try and pull it back and, and and explore learn and then present it in a way that it's like okay here's like a little bite size chunk for you to take away and I, and you know Kunz is a pretty good like a, a solid name to be to be to know more about do, do you get like ever feel 
like embarrassed to like the stars. The thing I really like about him particularly is how multifaceted you, my feelings towards him are. Like it's not, you yeah. know, like if I take like Frida, if I if I look at Frida Kahlo, I go, yes, I like you, I, you know, I, I, and then I look at like the, the history of Mexican painters and all this stuff and it's like, yeah, I, I, I really rate you. But when I look at Kunz, it's like, I hate you, but I really like you. And then I just have all these different feelings consistently going through about, you know, the different angles of what makes him the person that he is. Because on the one side, you look at it and you're like, yeah, I stand in front of one of your, you know, uh, seated ballerinas and I feel this reflective interaction coming through. And then the other side is where it's like, this is all sales bullshit. I had this thing with Coons and Hearst where if I could totally separate myself from the art market portion of it, I quite enjoy the work. Like with Coons especially, I remember seeing actually Coons's show of at Damien Hearst's space in London, the Newport Street Gallery, and kind of going into it like ah, I, don't know. I actually went with Lucy Sparrow, uh, and she was like, and I was kind of like, fuck Jeff Coons, I don't, I don't know, if, I don't know about this, and I was like, well, I and I walked in, I was actually quite impressed and really liked it. I was like, oh, I haven't, I guess I haven't seen a Coons show of all of his work together that ranges his career. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm cool with this. Like, I kind of like it and I, I'm kind of fascinated by it. And I'm, I, I'm not a, the art market stuff gets complicated. It gets complicated to, if you can kind of separate the two, which is hard with those two in particular. Those two, those two especially, it's yeah, borderline it's, impossible because it's, it's such a huge aspect of who they are, their identity, their persona, their their status within the art world. Right. Well, I mean, but you can't help but look at one of those balloon dogs and be like, you know, that's actually quite impressive of a piece of object, you know, an art, art piece. Like, there's not a yeah. single garden that that's not going to look amazing in. Not necessarily 58.4 million amazing, but it's going to look amazing. I remember Damien Hurst having his show at the Tate Modern couple years ago, maybe right when the Olympics were about to start, and Yao Yao Kusama had the other major solo show at the Tate at the same time. And I remember going into the, the hearse and walking through it and being like, yeah, this is pretty fa fascinating to see all his a career spanning Damien Hearst show, and then going into Yao Yao Kusama and being like, could these not be the most opposite blockbuster artists like in the world? Like, She was not motivated by the economics of the art world that early on and kind of and he manipulated the you know in his yeah. way you know she's gained so much more notoriety in the last 10 years like she's become such a different superstar than she was probably you know in the early 2000s just because those experiential instagrammable moments that she has um but it was such the opposite and i i love the fact that they were both so opposite i actually loved both shows by the way so i went to uh the freeze art fair in los angeles uh, last week, which was like the first one in Los Angeles. It was on the Paramount Pictures studio lot. It was pretty dope. Like that part of it was really cool. And the fair itself looked really nice. It was in a cool area. And you know, Los Angeles had a bunch of fairs going on. I, I really like Los Angeles. Had a great time. But do you notice when people are in like day two of a fair week, they just look like a miserable lot, don't they? The, well, you mean the, the staff and the people? The staffing. I mean, I almost wanted to give everybody a hug and, like, go buy them a chocolate or something. I don't know. I was just, like, walking around, like, man, everyone, are they, are they hungover? Are they just, I don't know. It just, I got a feeling, I feel bad for staffs at art fairs for sure. Yeah. You can see that, that little sort of, like, that real dead behind the eyes look at the end if it's like a the sunday night or the sunday afternoon whenever it is the, the thing's about to wrap up like uh, that's it, that's it there's no soul left it has been a hundred percent sucked out of them by the dementors uh, and the thing is like when we do the the juxtapose clubhouse in miami it's like people are a little burnt out but it's because they've kind of been partying a little bit but i don't know if these people i don't know if like you're in like the fancier kind of contemporary art world you're like well we went out till three in the morning uh clubbing or uh you know drinking at a dive bar in silver lake i don't think that's the, maybe it is do you think they do I've, I've never been out with the freeze crew no i'm not invited to those parties <laughs> hey if you know someone that works for freeze do they go out till three in the morning drinking at dive bars during freeze week let us know can someone please invite us because next time we want to go and just get just get involved a little bit 
I also miss Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt was at the fair at the same time I was at, and I really would have liked to have seen him. That's like a that's like a that's a good star sighting. That's something to tell your mom. Are you gonna go up and give him a subscription for him? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to be like, hey, did you read Jux Pose here? I'm gonna hand you this. Oh, uh, by the way, we're announcing our new issue, our new spring issue next week. I forgot to mention that. I should have mentioned that at the beginning. Um, tell us, Evan, what what can we expect? What can, what can we expect in the new issue? This is I love I love our intros to the podcast. We just go all over the place. It's great. We got to collaborate very closely with the great Ian Cox, the photographer, Wall Candy, and an artist by the name of Lucy Sparrow on a very special cover. I can say that because um, it's been leaked out already, and uh, it kind of fits with the theme of the 25th anniversary. Just artists doing you know kind of artists doing fascinating work at the moment. Artists doing kind of something a little special for our cover and. The entire issue is actually heavy on painting, but Lucy Sparrow brings the craft. I was going to ask, actually, because we've talked about this before, about the kind of the, the weightedness of painting this year. Have you been actively trying to avoid overloading your painters? No, not actively trying to avoid. I think this issue just in particular, when you come out of Miami, you just, yeah, for some reason, I think everybody who work, works for Juxpose and writes for Juxpose gets really, like, excited about painting every year out of Miami. Like, it seems like painting uh, just gets us really excited. So we have, like, pretty much – so in this issue, we have Neo Rausch. We have Julie Curtis. We have Emily Mae Smith. We have Vaughn Spann. We've got uh, Javier Cala, Cala – Anthony, Anthony Mikolif. How do you say Anthony? Uh, I've always called him Anthony, but maybe you say Anthony. Yeah, Anthony Mikolif. Uh So it is. It's heavy. It's heavy on the painters for sure. And then Lucy Sparrow. Fans of Radio Juxtapose will already be very familiar with Lucy Sparrow. Fans of Radio Juxtapose have already heard her and episode number one, which we will re sort of relaunch with the cover story. But uh, yeah, so that's exciting. I you know now that we only launch four issues a year, it's. I get kind of excited when we launch an issue. I, I was just going to say, as we go into this, the the, the, the meat in this sandwich, um, or for the vegans that are listening, the, I, I, I have no idea what you have in a sandwich. Just bread. <laughs> the third slice of bread in your sandwich. <laughs> what did you eat today? Water. <laughs> just couscous again. I just love it. Oh, man. We went from my shitty sweater to your fucking couscous. I love it. This is the best. So we go in. We got. I, I, I really, really enjoyed um, talking to Revoke. He gave us a little a little bit more than I think he, he necessarily wanted to give. We, we sort of teased it out of him. And so we, we, we're covering some good ground. Do you want to contextualize just in case someone's listening to this and they're like, I don't really know Revoke's work? Yeah, so one of the things that was really – I'm happy that he mentioned is he mentioned that he lived in San Francisco in the late 90s, which he and Saber and Ty and I believe – I don't know if MQ was doing anything here yet and Barry McGee and the Mission School people. Like San Francisco was a really great place for graffiti in like the late 90s. I mean it was so good. Um, but anyway, he's a a very, very famed, if not the most famous – Along with Saber and Retina and Slick and a bunch, a couple other people, but like L.A. graffiti writers, like very much Southern California, big, bold, aggressive, just assassin on the street style graffiti, um, but also very innovative and extremely technically savvy and uh, just kind of just one of those people, one of those kind of like pioneers of graffiti, but also just one of those just influential, stylistic, great graffiti writers. Well, and then what's amazing is that what he discusses with us a little bit is that he uh, had some legal problems, uh, and in those legal problems sort of reassessed why he was doing what he was doing and sort of reassessed his relationship with art um, and became not only like an experimental artist but someone who's just trying different te techniques and styles to create abstract – mark making that's still kind of in the roots of graffiti but definitely left field of the actual tag way left field you know and it's 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 just so encompassing of so many different elements different styles uh different facets completely 
in the execution, the performance, and the final result, which just give you yeah. this completely reinvented artist, but still confidently, and this is what I found really interesting, confidently going under the ethos and the brand and the name of Revoke, unafraid right. to to feel that he has to back down and change and and sort of and, and be, you know become someone else, just unashamed in the in, in in his position as that so it's it's a real for me that feels like a really refreshing angle from graffiti because i feel like graffiti yeah. has that limitation on it and i feel that he managed to break through that and his move and he wasn't gonna say it but his move to detroit and those assemblages that he was doing with found objects around detroit in this sort of new way of like taking stuff, fr taking this this kind of outdoor from the street style and, and contextualizing it for a gallery or even just for his own practice, like I he to me put Detroit on the map in a very interesting way, and sort of that change of his practice kind of changed I think the way people were looking at Detroit as a possibility for art, especially in the kind of the world that Juxtapose covers and it allowed him to sort of figure out how to make these next steps. And I, what I love about him is that everything he does is very polarizing. And I think it's fascinating that there's this group of people that is, and it, it really blows my mind that people are like upset that he's like trying stuff out in his studio, like very upset about it. Like what, I don't understand, this is not art. What do you, and it's like, no wait, hold on a second. He just allowed us in his studio to show us things that he's working on and practicing and you're upset about it. And there's just something about it that people just need a, a brush on a, on a canvas for it to be real. I don't know, but it's so fascinating that this guy is exploring and changing, experimenting and learning and people get like all fed up about it. I love it. Do you have any like shows coming up or anything? Or are you just kind of making work and it's kind of going out of your studio? No, I have a show coming up. Um, you know, the gallery I work with, Library Street. Yeah. Um, we're doing a show uh, at the beginning of April. That's great. You know, man, I'm so glad Library Street just like turned the volume up on like how influential they are. Because I feel like they've just kind of like, all right, we – we we have a really good art collection. We have good contacts. Like we're just gonna do everything now. I like it. Uh, without kind of putting their business kind of out there too much, you know, they started off with another partner. I think I think both of you and I know that his partner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. once they severed that relationship, I think that thing the the momentum really started picking up, and they were able. They weren't basically like banging heads with this other party, and they were able to kind of to the projects that they felt, you know, best about and just kind of go in a, in a, in their direction that they intuitively felt was right for them. Uh, instead of constantly having to kind of, you know, pull dead weight or bang heads with somebody. So I think that that probably happened in, uh, I don't know, I want to say 2014, I think it was. Yeah. When that happened, things really, really change. And I mean, yeah, I, I just can't even express enough how grateful I am for my relationship with them. I mean, beyond like just a professional working relationship, just, you know, personally, like Anthony is like, he's like a real friend of mine. He's such a great dude. How, how is the work shaping up for your upcoming solo show at library street? Well, yeah, it's, it's, um, initially like they, they got this new space. They recently bought this new space. It's just like, it's crazy, incredible space. I don't know the square footage. It's like, I don't know. It's like 40,000 square feet or something. They bought this massive, beautiful, historic church in uh, Detroit. And I was their first show at their current space downtown in 2012, I believe it was. And what, what it, Anthony's idea was is for me to kind of be the first person to show at this new space of theirs. But like all kind of rehab construction projects, as soon as they kind of got into it, you know, they realized it's probably not going to be ready until, <laughs> you know, late 2020. And initially we were talking about doing something uh, this this early summer of this year. So but since last year, I've kind of been in the frame of mind where I'm I've been making this work for this like really grand, big space with like 40 foot ceilings, you know, mm -hmm. and um, 
and then when you know it came to the realization that that what the space wasn't going to be ready he then approached anthony then uh approached me and asked me if, if you know i'd be willing to like kind of bump the show forward and just do it at their current space in april it's been a little bit challenging for me because i've been making i've been making work kind of with with the intention of it all kind of being presented in this like really big massive grand space it is like a church you know so uh, now I'm, i've for the last two months i've kind of been going back and trying to reimagine the show and the, and the smaller tighter space that they have downtown and and like that's kind of made it a little bit challenging for me to i think probably show some of the works that i've been making so i'm having to kind of scramble a little bit and and pump out uh, a bunch of uh new works for the show that you know would will kind of work better in that smaller kind of confined space but you know whatever that's all i do is is just come to the studio and make work every day so for me it's not a big deal are these works the works that you're doing that you've been showing on instagram just for point of reference i'll show some stuff on instagram yeah. you know i probably for every four things or five things i make in the studio i'll post a photo of one on instagram Mm -hmm. But, um, so I, you know, I just, all I've been doing the last eight years is just making work every day. You know, I mean, that, that's all, I, that's what I did kind of before I had a studio practice, just like in a different kind of, uh, medium and, and place, you know, but I don't know. I don't know what else to do. I just have to make work every day. So, and when was uh, the last time you did a show, a solo show, mm. uh, that you got to really kind of like craft your own kind of environment as it were. The last time I did a solo show was with this gallery in New York. I think that would have been, um, I guess it would have been two years ago now. I don't know. I have no sense of time. Um, <laughs> yeah, because I, like I said, I just, I'm in my fucking cave all the time. I really don't come outside and get much sunlight unless I like go on holiday with my wife. So I think it was like two years ago, I did the last time I did a solo show. And that was like with this gallery in New York, kind of a big mistake. I wish I hadn't have done it. I, I think I was a little bit seduced by the uh, idea that they were across the street from the Whitney, <laughs> I thought that, that that meant something, but I came to realize you want to you want to give a shout out to anyone in particular <laughs> on that. I think he just did. Uh. <laughs> but yeah, I, yeah, I, I'm I'm looking forward to that to that in April. I um, uh, Anthony and I are are talking about right now doing a um, a big installation with that will work in uh, kind of like as a collaboration with a. Um, this violinist uh, is gonna, we're going to do like a, a big installation in the space and this this like violinist is going to perform in the space it's, it's pretty exciting especially because so much of what i do you know or at least what i've been doing the last few years like really kind of directly ties in well for me personally like with music and i think a lot of it is kind of inspired by like certain types of music are, are just kind of audio recordings so that makes sense and i'm and i'm looking forward to it. it's going to be exciting I, I think roger's thing is going yeah roger's thing i think is going to happen like may or something yes, in new I york I, i'll be involved with that again have you incorporated it. have you have you sort of created a, a a partnership with music in this in this way before i've it's something that i've been thinking about for a long time that i i haven't really <laughs> kind of got to sink my teeth into i these one paintings in particular i've been making I call them like loop paintings. Um, they're they're really like they're kind of like drawing directly upon kind of two influences. One like kind of Frank Stella, the other this the sound composer William Bazinski. And there's like a big kind of audio component to these paintings that I've been trying to like realize the last few years. I just haven't really found the right kind of software person to help me help me kind of write the software or create the software that I need to kind of do these sound compositions that that will be paired with the paintings, but all these paintings, this one particular body of work, I've been making these like loop paintings. Like I've been making them for the last couple of years with the intention of kind of going back and revisiting each one and making like a shadow of each painting that is like a, a, an audio composition. So I'm still trying to kind of work out like that, that the technical aspects of like kind of creating the software that would do that. The way you yeah. speak about all these different elements and components and kind of and senses, does it bug you when people refer to you as a graffiti artist? <laughs> yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I mean, look, I, you know, I probably am not doing myself any favors by doing like kind of uh, presenting my like studio practice, like, you know, under my my like graffiti identity. But 
while they're like separate from one another, they're not really separate from one another. I mean, they, I created this kind of alter ego, this identity for myself, you know, when I was like 13 years old, you know, I'm 42 now, and it's been my entire life. I've never really lived any part of my life as Jason Williams, you know, since I was a kid, I've, I created this other identity for myself because I wanted to own my identity. I, I wanted to control my destiny, really, you know, and I didn't like the box that I was put into by that other identity. So I wanted to create one for myself, a new one for myself that I total ownership and authorship over. And that experience, you know, I, I don't know how long I've painted graffiti for, like since 1990, what is that, 29 years I've painted graffiti. That experience directly and indirectly has brought me to this point. And everything I'm doing here in the studio is in some form or another is like reflects that past experience in my life. So I, it just wouldn't make sense to, I, I would feel like a betrayal of my, of my, I would betray, I would, I would be committing a betrayal of my own identity in my entire life. If I were to just drop that name revoke and, you know, come out showing work under my like birth name, government name or whatever, you know, so I understand how that, that like further, compromises and complicates that that situation where like I just kind of get dismissed as like a graffiti artist or street artist or something like that but you know it's not right. something I would be willing to let go of for the sake of making it easier for other people to like see see the work that I'm making and, and like as what it is without kind of unpacking it from that other kind so of you, stigma you, know? you won't be dropping that Monica anytime anytime soon then and kind of going down that fine art, you know, root that is so kind of, you know, people get to a certain point and that's it. They just, they, they, they can't get rid of the name fast enough and they want to kind of, they want to be, you know, more accepted within the fine art community, but you, you're not, not jumping ship anytime soon then. No, why would I? That, I mean, isn't that what art is about? Art is, art is, art is like a, it's supposed to be a place of absolute truth and freedom. You know, art is supposed to be liberating and, and like, why would I, uh, why would I compromise that, you know? Well, you know, it's interesting because as you say that, I'm I'm thinking of the work, the, the works that you're doing with the machines in your studio. There, there is this interesting polarizing sort of conversation that happens, especially in the juxtaposed comments. Oh, you guys got some good comments. Oh, <laughs> some amazing comments. But like what I think it's so fascinating when I see those comments because one, it, exactly what you said, art is about freedom, art is about trying out things, about finding truth, it's about, you know, and you're showing people your practice and you're showing people your experiments and you're showing people this sort of side of you that's not just about doing spray cans on the street. Like it's all about this exploration. And I'm how do you like what's why do you think those pieces tend to be so polarizing? <laughs> they're, they're great, man. I love I screen grab them. I love them. Most of them <laughs> most, like, most of them are just like, how is this art or what is he I mean, it's they're kind of they're very, very uh, immature and not really full of depth, these comments. For sure. Obviously, yeah. And when you yeah. click on the people's Instagram profile, like, you know, you just have to glance at their page for a second. It's, it's, I, I love that. I love that they're so, I love that it's so challenging for people. I love that it, it, uh, it inspires that kind of reaction. Like people, like, people like get like proper angry. Like, like <laughs> they really do. Angry. I, they're like offended. They're angry. They feel, you know, they feel so um, just confused or like caught off guard or offended by it that they're they'll go out there publicly and like talk shit, you know. And I I, I really enjoy that. I like that. And, and I um. But do you, you know, but do you think that. those are people that were like revoke graffiti fans at all, or do you think that's just people who are like new to the whole thing and have a comment to make? Well, I think that my peers. I mean, like, I can't, I can't, I'm just making a generalized, yeah, you know, sure. assumption right now. But, you know, for the most part, I think my peers, you know, and, and by peers, I mean, people that have a shared experience as, as, as myself that, that have been kind of involved in and, and like personally invested in like that thing for like the same amount of time as I have. Uh, I think a lot of them kind of get it, or if they don't really get it, they can at least appreciate it. You know, it's typically usually younger kids that are like overly idealistic and a bit naive and just, you know, very focused on one lane and anything that challenges that or doesn't really kind of fit into that, that like that package is like, you know, just confusing and, and therefore just disregarded or, or hated on by them. I was one of those people at one time too, you know, I've, I've undergone 
I like to think that I've matured and grown up and, and opened up, you know, you know, to a lot of things as I've gotten older. And, and, you know, I was once young and like extremely idealistic and super ignorant as fuck. And, you know, I dropped out of high school when I was 15 years old, you know, I, and I, and I, you know, I thought I knew everything for most of my life. And, you know, I, I, I probably did and said a lot of real stupid, ignorant, obnoxious shit over the course of my life. And, uh, you know, I once kind of shared those similar type of views that I see kids express, you know, towards me or in reference, at least to my work on like social media. I once had similar views, you know, towards like street art or like stenciling or wheat pasting or or uh, or art or really even art as a whole. You know, I grew up I grew up like in a very uh, uneducated, you know, suburban kind of working class family you know nobody went to college or had a, had an art degree i mean you know art was something that was like this like for this like these like snobby e elite people that i just didn't understand and uh it it was just beyond my perception you know or I, and and i once i once you know dismissed it and and had made you know stupid snide comments about it, it you know if you grew up in a, an environment disconnected from art what was it for you that was that little spark that moment where you 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 kind of like uh, you know you got drawn in i think that i think that just over the course of time you know just life experience just opens your eyes you know and i think that everything had to be a certain way and i and i was very insecure and i lived in fear and you hold on to and guard things that make you feel powerful and and, you know, make you feel secure when you reject anything that threatens you or makes you feel, you know, insecure. And, you know, as I, as I grew up and I, and I met people from like different, you know, from just different places with different life experience, uh, you know, they're much more informed and educated than I was. And I, I, I you know, they, I learned from them. I, and I, and I just, my perception and, and an openness just, you know, expanded as a result. I think a lot of, for a lot of my friends, a lot of my, like my really close friends that have, are like, have been like kind of, you know, guys in my crew that I've been doing graffiti with like the last 20 years. A lot of the guys in my crew that, that have become my really close friends and, and family really, you know, we all come from very different places and graffiti was the bond that, that brought us all together and, and kind of transcended all those boundaries that, that like normal society would have, would have like divided us meeting so many different people you know most of them graffiti writers just they just opened my eyes up to a different way of seeing the world and you know the first time i ever went to an art museum was barry mcgee show you know at de young in san francisco i moved to san francisco in like the fall in 97 and i think it was like an early 98 or, or maybe late 97 that he had a show and you know obviously i knew i was a graffiti writer so i knew who twist was and, um, you know, I wanted to go to this, like, museum to see, like, this graffiti guy, Twist, is having an art show at a museum? What the fuck? Like, it just, I couldn't even wrap my head around it. But I went, that was the first time I ever set foot in a museum. You know, just experiences like that just really opened my eyes up to, like, what art really is. You know, I had this, I had this, like, uh, I had this idea of, of art as just, like, this, like, like, elitist decoration or something before, you know, for, for like, very privileged bougie bourgeois people and and uh you know i i i realized that you know at some point like oh I, like i kind of am an artist like this is this is what <laughs> i'm doing like I'm, I'm painting and like and this is like just a, a a path to like freedom and an entirely create an entirely different world and way of way of seeing and experiencing and communicating and feeling and like tapping it exploring yourself and your and your inner self and like things that just everyday life and working in nine to five, you, you know, I think that you, um, you just end up kind of closing off those like doors of perception and just well, that, that sensory, you know, how much did moving to Detroit and getting out of Los Angeles change your trajectory? Well, I mean, that was a long, that was a long time coming. I mean, I, I had, I had known, I had, I've never, I've my entire life. I've never lived like even growing up as a kid going to school, like I never, I never went to the same school two years in a row. You know, my dad moved around constantly. I usually started a, you know, started the school year at a school and finished it at another, at another one, and then did the same thing the following year. Like that, that's just how I've always lived. But was this all in Southern California? No, okay. All, Southern California, Phoenix, Arizona, and suburban Phoenix. I lived in Nashville, Tennessee for a little while. My father, you know, I mean, I got 
I got kicked out the house when I was 15 and, and my dad ended up moving to Nashville. And like a, a year later, I, I went, I kind of reunited with my dad and went out there and I lived out there for a little while when I was like 17. And, um, but anyways, like, you know, that, that time I had been in, in LA before I left to Detroit, I had been in LA for like nine years or 10 years or something like that. And I had been living in the house that I had for like four years. That's the longest I had ever lived lived in a house in my life <laughs> you know <laughs> and it was just starting it was just starting to stink you know it was just it was like i had been doing a lot here and i knew that i knew that i was getting really hot here but on top of that on top of like my legal trouble and all that you know it was around that time probably a year or two leading up to me leaving la it was when i first really started being excited about like making making that wasn't in the context of graffiti, you know, it, it was at that time that, that like I, I started having ideas that would require me to kind of step away from graffiti and like, and like kind of enter a new environment and like explore a whole new process of kind of like making these ideas like, you know, into reality. And that started being really challenging for me in LA because um, I've been like doing one thing for like a while and I had kind of transitioned into doing this kind of like freelance commercial design work you know a lot of it just kind of like illustration graphic design stuff i was i was like doing stuff for like uh like movie and tv production like art department shit and you know all my time was was spent really kind of doing commercial work and being like really frustrated and annoyed with that and but then also too just kind of i had this certain lifestyle in la and just the cost of living in la everything was really expensive so i i i had to just be hustling all the time chasing money and I didn't really have the the freedom and the resources to just kind of own my time and just spend time kind of exploring and experimenting. You know what I mean? So I knew that, you know, and then and then that compounded with like this, the fact that like I had the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, you know, hunting me down and like, you know, <laughs> throwing me in jail every opportunity they got that, you know, I just I just realized it was time to go and, and time to leave L.A. In the interview in Jux, you kind of mentioned um, your time in county jail as a kind of, as a period of reflection and where you actually, you kind of speak of it and like, a, that was really kind of good for me and kind of getting clarity for my next direction. Um, is, that a, is that something you'd recommend? And have yes. you ever... <laughs> Yeah, Every yeah, county yeah. jail is a special type of hell. I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. There's a, there's a whole there's a whole breed of people that love being in there. They love jail, and it's not it's not it's not a place anybody that isn't one of those people wants to be. Believe me. No, I I, I think that I just um, I think that I just uh, I try to make the best of a good situation, but uh, I mean a shitty situation. But but really, um, I think that what, what was unique about that situation uh, was just just quiet and lack of lack of distractions you know i, I think that uh, i kind of have like severe add as it is but i just I, in this city is like uh it's just like I, just, I think that i'm just i'm just always caught up and never able to just be quiet and still and just kind of reflect you know and, and not have all these different elements pulling at my senses and, and just kind of distracting me and trying to get my attention and it, in there uh and there I, I read like i don't know i must i read over 30 books i um and when i wasn't reading i i was just either working out or or thinking and just reflecting you know and while that during while i was in there i i i i just kind of did everything in my head that i ended up spending the next kind of two years doing once i got out into the world uh, and, um, and that was, that, that was in Detroit. I mean, I, I went to Detroit and I didn't know a single person that lived there. Um, I went there like in the dead of February, like two feet of snow with my, <laughs> with my friend, my friend next was living in Chicago next door at the time. And he knew his way around there a little bit. And he, he had told me a bit about it and he got me kind of hyped up on it. So I, I went out there and he met me out there and him and I just had like a, like a rad first couple of days. And then he had to leave and go back to Chicago. And I was there for like three or four more days by myself. And I just, I felt, I fell in love with the place because it just felt absolutely free, you know, and, um, and, and, uh, and felt like kind of anything was possible there, you know, I ended up getting a place there and then coming back to LA to finish up like the installation for that art, the street show at Mocha. And then like immediately after 
I was I was flying to Ireland, and then from Ireland I was going to go back to Detroit, basically like unpack all my shit, start living there. And that's when I ended up going to jail, and uh, they arrested me at the airport. And uh, I was in there for like two months, and and like yeah, like I was saying, just while I was in there, I uh, I, I just I just sat I just sat there and like in my head and just kind of went through the figured out the process and just went through everything in my head. So once I once I I got out and then finally got back to Detroit. I was just, I was just like, I think a lot of the kind of, it was almost like going to the studio. It would just without using my hands, you know? So as soon as I got there and I, and I got my feet in the ground and I was able to use my hands, I already had kind of figured out a lot of the technicalities and the kind of design elements and the, and the, and parts of the process that like, I probably would have spent a long, a lot of time doing, but I had already kind of done them in my head while I was in there. And I was only able to do that because it was, you know, I didn't have a cell phone. I didn't have a girlfriend. I didn't have like, you know, all the, all just life, all this shit going on. Like you're like, you're pushing pause basically on time while you're in there. It's like the world's going on outside, but you're frozen in this moment. And, um, and I think I just was able to just take advantage of that time to just like, just to exhale and, and just was the work that came out of that, the assemblages, the found object assemblages. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and and that was a big reason why I went to Detroit was because, I mean, obviously there there was just an abundance of like materials to like explore and use there. You know, I had I had first I had I had had this kind of idea for a while that I wanted to really experiment with and figure out. The first time I had done it was in Miami. When I did that this piece in Miami, it, it was I spent like just two weeks, um, just kind of scavenging the like. At that time, like, you know, that that like Wynwood area was Liberty City. It wasn't it wasn't like the arts district yet. And there was just all kind of shit that all these abandoned buildings and structures and just all this like neglected kind of physical stuff it, that was just, you know, part of the city that you could kind of like just steal and exploit and use. And um, that's what I did there in Miami. And that was the first time I ever enjoyed making something as much as I enjoyed painting graffiti and I got really hyped on it. So, so that was why I, one of the reasons why I had Detroit in mind and I went there and I just, I, I really, really fell in love with the city. And yeah, I spent like four years there doing that assemblage work. And um, when my daughter was born, my wife wanted to come back here and, and be close to her mother for obvious reasons. So I, at first I got the house here and I set them up here and I, I had to keep my studio there for like, almost like another year and I was just going back and forth there working kind of finishing up every all everything that I had already kind of scheduled and then you know when I shut my studio down there and I and I came came back to LA full time I mean that was the end of that chapter like you know didn't make any sense it didn't make sense for me obviously to continue making that that body of work so you know I I kind of took some of the elements of that process of that work that I had been making and kind of created something new with it but really, I, I just I just kind of closed the book and walked away from that body of work altogether and started doing something new. And, you know, eventually after, I don't know, a year and a half or two years, I kind of came back around to painting. You know, I'd been painting graffiti so long for so many years that I just had this real specific way of mark making that I didn't want to be present in my studio work. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I, I really kind of, I wanted to kind of like kill that ego in a sense and like, not rest or rely on those, what was familiar and comfortable for me. I wanted to kind of use this really rigid discipline, like very limited way of shaping and, and making things that, to kind of force myself to, to break that habit and not rely on that, on that, like that comfortable gestural way of mark making that I had for so long. I didn't want my studio work to be, to just look like a, a watered down or a, or a, arted up version of my graffiti you know what i mean and so where did your first sort of idea um for the for the instruments come from and had you, are you based off of something else that you had seen before or what what was it that kind of that really steered you in this direction i've been like really interested in this like uh like mechanized kind of way of, of like early early technology you know like not like pre-computer, like a print, like the old printing press and how like you can, you could just repeat something over and over and over again, but like 
it's not a perfect technology and there's the, these little kind of flaws and inconsistencies that happen in the, in, in like the, the repetition process, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I started getting really interested in, in, uh, that kind of pr production process. And uh, there was a few other things I was doing first. And, uh, I had been doing this, I had been like really into this idea of like a repeated spray can mark, like over and over, like hatching, you know, mm -hmm. I had been doing it in my pieces for a while. But I can never kind of get it quite right. Like I, I always was really frustrated. Like I wanted to be able to like create some kind of comb that I could do it all in one stroke because I like this like unified, almost like just copy paste, copy paste, copy paste, but not like a, a literal like direct kind of mirrored repetition. This like slightly changing imperfect kind of repetition. I was I've been really into it for a while. And if you go back and look at a lot of the graffiti I've been painting, the uh two thousands, like I was always tr trying to kind of achieve this technique. And I I've, I've seen a few a few people doing like creating cool tools to kind of create effects like that. And there was a, there was two guys actually that had done something similar with a spray with a spray can uh machine in Europe that had done something there was this guy, I think his name is AK. I remember seeing this video. He had built like this like uh like this trailer that he pulled behind his bicycle, like with a yes. big long mounted arm, and he just like pulled up to a wall and hit a switch, and it made this big arm like swing with different colors. It was like a giant rainbow on a wall. Yeah, and, uh, I remember that guy. Yeah, it was really really cool. I did a show uh, with this gallery in Germany, uh, Rutkowski sixty eight, and the the owner of that gallery had this other artist that that he uh, he worked with. This guy, um, Daniel Daniel Weisbach, I think his name is, and he showed me this video of this of this instrument. It's like basically the same type of thing that he had made, but I think it had like twenty cans or something like that, and he mounted it to the side of like a like a vertical pole that's like parallel right to the tracks, and he mounted it to the side of this structure so that when the train went by, it just sprayed all these lines like repeating top to bottom on the whole train end to end. I remember being like really blown away by that. And then there was a few, and then, you know, Detroit, there's this guy, uh, James Collins, who makes these really, really fucking cool paintings where he, he does like a similar technique, but he uses like acrylic and oil paint. And like, he uses the two against one another. Like he scrapes away the top layer of oil paint uh, or the of acrylic paint from the oil paint underneath. And he creates this like comb effect. So there's a few people I had seen doing something similar that was really cool, but I had this idea to, to create something like my like this myself. But I wanted to kind of follow the same philosophy of of a lot of the other work that I've been making, where where it's not it's not something that's really kind of a gestural painting tool. It's something that just is supposed to kind of reflect the space and the shape of whatever wh whatever field that it kind of exists in do you think that there's too much of this kind of desire for things to be perfect in the art scene now you know i mean projectors are pretty commonplace people are you know they they want things to look clean do you see this as kind of almost like a, a sort of response to that yeah i think so i mean i like again like i like this i really like this like idea of symmetry but but not quite symmetry like like mechanized kind of production but flawed and imperfect you know i could easily or someone could easily make some of these things that i'm making and have them be perfect but that kind of defeats the whole purpose at least for me personally i like i like within these kind of kind of creating creating this almost predetermined system of like how things are going to go but but within that there's this there's all this room for like you know, spontaneity and just kind of un, unintended kind of chaos to, to happen. So with with these paintings, particularly like the instrument paintings that I've been making, I, I see like people often will, you know, I post a video showing the process of me doing that final kind of stroke or whatever. And I'll see how people like will make all these suggestions of like things that I could do to like make it perfect so that it doesn't drip or splatter or the line doesn't wobble. And I think that a lot of people kind of fail to understand that that's the whole point of the thing. Like, you know, it, it's like, it's almost like a caveman technology. You know, it's like, it's not, it, it's like meant to do a job, but it's not supposed to be perfect. It's, I'm counting on all of these things happening that I'm not intended for. And for me, that's kind of what makes it interesting. Do you see the well, performance element of it as quite an intrinsic part of the pro of the kind of final product? I think I just came to realize, like, it, it's all done very, like, sincerely and, and like, not, 
with this like ambition or master plan. You know, I, I, I started doing them. And then at some point I was like, Hey, I should, I should film this while I do it. And like, and then I saw it and I liked the way it looked and it. And then it just kind of present like, Oh, I, you know, I, I posted a few of these paintings. Maybe I should just post one of these videos because I like the video and I think it looks cool seeing, seeing how it's done, how it's done, how fast it happens, you know, through just the process of making these paintings, I, I started realizing, Oh, there is like, yeah, an actual like performance element to it. You know, the painting happens so quick and so fast. I, I don't even realize how my body moves. And it's not until after like seeing the videos and like watching myself being like detached and just observing all these things happening that are completely self-conscious and unintentional in my mind while I'm doing them. I, I started to maybe to, to appreciate a little bit of that element of it. And then now, yeah, I guess that's kind of factored into it a little bit. And I think of them more as just like, paintings but but you know also a bit of a, like a, a physical performance as well how did you do the one i mean maybe we're not supposed to say that you did this one but how did you do the one outside of mass mocha because <laughs> <laughs> i was there in the middle of a major snowstorm and i look out and i see this wonderful piece by you i wish so much that i had my uh, my buddy my assistant with me to, to film that one because that was a good oh, one it's a good one it, that was a very physical uh, per performance. That was because uh, when I was there, it was in the summertime, and that thing was raging. Like that aqueduct was raging with water, and so I had to. So I actually went. Um, I tried doing it before, and um, there was just too much kind of going. It's a really sleepy, small little town. There's just yeah. like, there's a lot kind of going on in that street, and I couldn't really like pull it off. So, it, so like this band I really love. Um, just happened to be performing there. I was there doing a residency in like in the Hudson Valley in New York. And, and, but it's a quick drive over there, you know? Right. And, um, this band, I really love uh, grizzly bear. They were performing there. So I worked it out. So I, I, I get it all set up. Uh, I had to rappel down in there because there's no way to get <laughs> access to it. And so I had to, I had to like, you know, it's like a 20 something foot drop. I had to rappel down in there. So I went to, I, I got everything set up. I went to the grizzly bear concert. Um, and uh, I left early, like in the middle of the last song, or I, I thought that they were wrapping it up. So I, I knew that that would be a good time to get out of there and go because the street was just dead. It was completely quiet around there. Um, so I was able to rappel down. And then as the show finished and everybody was like leaving the museum, I was down there doing it. Uh, yeah, I had to get like the knee high, like rubber, like those boots that fishermen wear, like when they like fly fish and stand in the river, you know, I had to, I had to rappel down and like wear those big boots because it was like a foot and a half of water, and that shit was like rushing, yeah, coming at you really hard. So yeah. I think it's like three hundred and twenty or three hundred, almost thirty feet long. And um, man, like two thirds of the way through that shit, I was getting pretty exhausted. Like the the, <laughs> the instrument itself is pretty heavy, but um, trying to like maintain like my like that rigid kind of repeating motion over and over. And not kind of get tired and deviate from like the spacing and the and the and the big kind of curved uh, motion over and over, like two thirds of the way through, like fighting, like like walking against that that like rush of water, it, it got pretty exhausting. And then towards the end, uh, the water gets a lot deeper and it's coming in with a lot more force. So like I was pretty gassed out at the end. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I, I'm 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 kind of proud of that one. But it, <laughs> that, that's but it, museum. But it, what an incredible museum! I mean, I've, I've uh, exactly I've been going to museums, you know, and and this has got to be one of the best institutions in the United States. What an oh, sure. amazing collection they have! I, I'm like a huge James Terrell fan. That guy has like one of his the best kind of collections of his work and his installations there in that place. And then you have this massive building where it's just like two football fields long. Nothing but windows on one side there's no there's no work to look at on that side it's just look out the windows at this one massive continuous wall i couldn't i couldn't pass up and yeah, but it, but it <laughs> the, creates a good they're dichotomy. probably not gonna ever let me in there so that's that's the only way yeah. i'm gonna get in there. <laughs> that's the thing is it creates this wonderful dichotomy of like that museum's about experimentation plus the classics where it's like what you're doing is like your classic kind of Southern California graffiti writer doing this experimentation. It actually works wonderfully. I almost thought it was curated. I was like, do they actually, do they know? Do they know? They've acknowledged it. I yeah. think it's pretty cool that they've acknowledged it. Yeah. yeah. 
So I want to go into something. I don't know how much you're going to be able to talk about this, but it's something that I know our listeners need to at least hear us ask the question. Um, how how much did the H and M thing change uh, ch- change your trajectory, uh, and how much of a whirlwind was that for you? And did you even remotely expect it to be that crazy? I don't know how familiar you are with my, but I've been quite a few of those like over exaggerated kind of instances. You know, it's not really anything new for me. That uh, that experience in particular, I don't think it changed anything. I think it just what it what it did accomplish in doing, which I'm very proud of, is making people consider and just bring it, you know, bring the conversation to the table about, mm-hmm. you know, artist rights and just the continuing this total disregard of disrespect for artists, you know. Everybody is compensated and, and respected and acknowledged for the work that they do. Uh, usually artists are the last people to kind of get any credit or respect for what it is that, you know, that they do. And particularly that like big corporate world, I mean, they, they just fuck over artists every day and use people's work and never apologize for it and, and, and don't really see anything wrong for it. And, and that's something personally I feel very strongly about. When you were going into that, was it kind of like, look, let's just let's just see what happens, or or was it like, yeah, this is this is you know, I'm I'm in the right here. This we're, we're taking them down, kind of thing. I've had I've had a few of those situations happen uh, already at this point, and you know, initially I I was just I, I I'm probably not doing myself any favors if I if I speak in detail about the situation. Um, <laughs> But, you know, initially I had no no intention other than I just wanted it to be over with and to stop. And it was it, you know, the way that they reacted initially uh, really kind of changed that. But in the end, in the end, uh, it worked out. It it ended up they they really stepped up and, and, you know, took responsibility for what they did. And they 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 handled it in a, you know, they handled it the way that the way that I would anybody would hope for it to be handled. And as a result, you know, we created something really positive out of the situation where like four different organizations in, in Detroit that, you know, directly benefit uh, children and women, you know, they got, they got some good funding, you know, that will probably be a substantial, you know, contribution yeah. To, yeah. to their efforts for, for a year or two, you know? And, and um, I'm happy that I'm just happy that it worked out positive. I'm happy that H and M and their people decided to kind of take responsibility and handle it the right way. And that, you know, collectively both parties were able to kind of create a positive thing for a positive, you know, multiple positive causes that wouldn't have had those resources otherwise. So, you know, every, 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 every bad situation that happens, you, you, you can take from it whatever you want, you know? But you can make How it just you when you saw the, the kids, uh, just I think it was was it in France, but there was like they were the H and M's were getting like extinguishers, absolutely hammered. Was were, were you sitting there going yeah, or were you sitting there going shit? This is this is not helping my case whatsoever. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I don't know. My dog's just looking at me with his eyes right now. He he's, he won't leave me alone. He wants me to give him a treat. <laughs> how do you like how do you like that for a left turn? Love that, it. That was good. That was that was really good. Know, buddy. What I like about your Instagram account is that you seem to be you seem to be kind of going through art history in a really, really organic way and kind of like learning along the way. have you are you kind of in a crash course about learning about all these different influences that hap that have kind of I, I, it just seems as if you're going through an education like in real time, and as you were talking I, that you didn't grow up around art, how, how has your taste changed? How have you kind of approached being influenced by all these different kind of things that you're showing on your Instagram? I, I think you're, you know, you're ob- the way that you described observing it is 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 totally correct. I mean, um, I think I might have said it when when we spoke for Juxt- or when I spoke Roger about juxtapose. I mean, for me, graffiti it started off as one thing where everything was just so exciting and uh and just like this this mysterious world of like of energy and like possibility was there like just beyond the horizon and every little every little glimpse you could get of it and every little information that i could soak up it was just so exciting and it was it was a constant learning experience you know 
And then over the course of time, you know, it became something entirely different to me. Uh, now, this this whole new experience for me is, in a lot of ways, it's it's like being a, a little kid again. You know, it's it's being uninformed and naive and and just hungry and excited, and enthusiastic and and just stoked. You know, and I've just, you know, I didn't I didn't go to art school. Uh, you know, I don't have any. I don't have any education on this, so I'm learning every day, and I'm just I'm just stoked to like see new things and just try to ingest as much information as I can, and and you know try to make sense out of it the best that I can. Thank you so much, man. That was great. I'm glad we did this. We got there in the end. Yes, we did. <laughs> best of luck with the show, man. Thank yeah. you, guys.